Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and learn leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm delighted to be here with you. I'm your host for Team Crevacore West. And today, I'm especially delighted to have with us special guest, Scott Aaron. Scott, can you say hi to our listeners? Hello, listeners. And Bertine, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to come on here today. It's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure having you here. So I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you, Scott. Scott is an internationally acclaimed and award-winning online marketer, best-selling author, top podcaster, and speaker. He is the go-to specialist when it comes to converting traffic, establishing connections, creating residual, using LinkedIn, and building personal brands. Fully immersing himself in learning LinkedIn and social media strategies, Scott quickly gained traction as a leader in generating big results for other entrepreneurs online business owners, and business coaches. Scott is passionate about helping fellow entrepreneurs achieve success while building their own network organically and without complicated and costly marketing tactics. His program has helped thousands experience explosive growth following his program. People-focused and result-driven, Scott's strategic approach to teaching others how to create wealth online and organic traffic is the game changer when it comes to competing in a saturated digital world. Scott, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Great to be here. So you and I have been trying to set up this interview for quite some time. So I'm especially delighted um, that we get to talk about this because it seems to me that our conversation especially the one that we had offline was so timely. So I, and it gave me an interesting perspective. So part of why I have the Global Fluency Podcast is so it's, it's partly selfish on my part so I can meet other people, network with other people and learn more about what everyone else does so I can help people have better conversations through our conversation. And I really loved hearing about your background and it, it was not, the typical diversity and inclusion just framework that I that I would look for normally. And so but when we got to talking, I was like, this is awesome. And I thought it would just be yet another level um, to that conversation. So yeah. can you tell us a bit about your professional background, your training and your company? So well, right now I own my own coaching and consulting firm that focuses on teaching business owners, entrepreneurs, sales professionals, anyone that really needs other people for growth, uh, how to leverage LinkedIn in a very genuine and authentic way without costly sales tactics or large amounts of money to be invested in, in how to grow their network, their business, and eventually their bank account. How I got to that was part of like the, the big journey of, of business. And I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I just turned 41 in April. And I started an entrepreneurship 23 years ago when I was 18. So I've never had a boss. I, I tell people that I'm psychologically unemployable because I've never, I've never worked for anybody and I, I never will. Because once you kind of see the other side of owning your own business, being your own boss, you realize that the amount of personal and business growth that you can achieve and attain, it's completely up to you. I never wanted to put myself in the position where someone was going to value my time or value my worth and pay me for what I know I'm capable of doing more and above and beyond myself. 
how I got into business, I was a brick and mortar business owner. My family and I had a string of health and wellness uh, clubs in Philadelphia. And I was also a certified sports nutritionist, personal trainer, and group fitness instructor. I did corporate wellness speaking. So I would go to local companies, nonprofits, and even schools, and I would do nutritional and uh, wellness seminars for 50 up to 500 people. How I got into that was a, a pretty unorthodox way. My father, prior to us opening our first gym uh, between 1997 and 1998, I came in in 98 going into 99. Prior to that, my father was working for a physical rehabilitation company that had a string of locations that would be in, in fitness clubs. So just like a chiropractor's office is sometimes in a gym, they had physical rehabilitation companies within these gyms. To make a long story short, my father ended up partnering with, with some people that were doing things kind of the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And my father got caught up in a $9.5 million insurance fraud case, which ended up having him go to federal prison for three years. And basically, this was my introduction to entrepreneurship because I was a sophomore in college going into, and I had to leave and transfer to Temple University in downtown Philadelphia to eventually take over my family's business, which was our first gym, as the owner because I needed to support my, my mother and my sister. But I, I fell in love with the industry. I fell in love with health and wellness. Obviously, still to this day, 23 years later, I work out every single day. I eat extremely healthy. I'm a very active person. But more so, I fell in love with people. Mm -hmm. You know, being in a, in a service-based business like a gym, where it's very intimate, you get to know people on a very, very personal level, you really start to understand the power of human connection. And if anybody decides to follow me on LinkedIn, that's my main platform, next to my name, you'll see something that says human connection expert, because that's one of my superpowers. Um, Love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> Two of my main superpowers is resiliency and overcoming obstacles because I had to I had to be resilient in life and in business, but also there was a lot of personal and professional obstacles that I had to overcome in the last 23 years that made me into the man and father and soon to be husband that I am today. But as far as really understanding human connection, whether you work for someone or work for yourself, it is the most valuable business tool that we all possess. It's inside of all of us. It's just some people choose to use it and some people choose not to use it. And for me, I saw the extreme benefit to working that, that muscle that, that I possessed in, in really forming meaningful connection and relationships with clients, with, with customers, with, with people. And basically, I've, I've taken that to every single business that, that I've owned and, and operated in. And uh, it's, it's my foundation. We've got some exciting news here at the Global Fluency Podcast. As your safety and continued learning remains our top priority, the 2020 Global Fluency Diversity and Inclusion Summit has gone virtual. The Global Fluency Podcast and Westbridge Solutions continue to see this as a time for growth and evolution. Take this opportunity to come join us virtually for our 2020 summit from the comfort of your own home. Going virtual has allowed us to offer all summit attendees tons of additional perks. When you register for the summit, you will receive access to all 12 of our key speakers during this live two-day summit. No need to choose breakout sessions. 30-day access to the replay of the summit with closed captions. Eligibility for SHRM, CCHI, NBCMI, and LPCA CEU credits. And for nonprofit organizations and interpreters, you will receive a special discount when you use code GF202045. Don't delay. Register today at www.globalfluencysummit.com. We look forward to seeing you at the virtual event. Well, I love that. I Like I said before, when we were talking offline, your journey resonated with me because it was so different from what I've heard other people talk about. Um, honestly, to be 18 years old and thrust into the world of entrepreneurship 
in the way that you were requires a lot of grit, right? But it also required, um, in my opinion, a lot of, of course, tenacity, but a lot of forward thinking, which I don't know that most 18-year-olds have at that age, right? I can tell you when I was 18, I was worried about college and like my hair <laughs> and, and, you know, it just, you know, just in playing violin and, you know, things like that. And, you know, who's going to what concert. So, you know, I, I really think your story is so inspirational, you know, to so many people. And, and that is a part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the show to talk about that in the hopes that it will continue to inspire those who think that they can't because of all of the obstacles that they are facing. So not only were you facing obstacles, but you were facing them at a very tender age, quite honestly. And so for you to have really risen above that, I love um, the power of resiliency. But let me ask you this, with regard to resiliency, how do you sustain that, right? How do you keep that going over time? Because being an entrepreneur is a daily battle. We have our ups and our downs, our highs and our lows. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I always describe it. I'm a a New Yorker at heart, born and bred, but I always describe Atlanta as the place where you can get frostbite and sunburn in the same day, right? So I I liken it to the entrepreneurial experience where you can just feel like you're on top of the world at 10.30 a.m. by noon you might be like, why did I go into this? And then by 1.30, you're just, you're having an, an existential crisis. And then by four, the day is great again. So how do you deal with that up and down? I think to your point, you know, being 18 and going through what I went through, I, I think it was kind of ideal for it to happen that, at the time that it did. I think any older, it, it would have been a much different experience. I was still at that age even as a teenager, even though I was a young adult, I was still a teenager. I was, I was 18. And what do most teenagers want to do? What do most kids want to do? They want to make their parents proud. Yes, indeed. Uh-huh. So there was that pride aspect when this was put on my plate. I'm not going to fold this hand. I'm, I'm not going to crawl up into a ball and, you know, in the corner. I'm, this, is, this is the hand that I was dealt mm-hmm. and I'm going to play it. And as far as resiliency, we've all been through moments in our life where we've had to push through and we've had to be resilient, whether it's, it's in school, whether it's in relationships or whatever it is. The only way to improve upon anything is to practice. Yes, absolutely. So practice takes practice. Now, was I, did I have a head start on resiliency? Probably. But it's no different than anything else that someone had to learn how to overcome. Every single one of us possesses the solution to all of our problems, except sometimes sometimes people get caught between the six inches between their ears and they start kind of talking themselves out of things or you're replaying the tapes or you're creating stories. So for me, the only way to progress forward is to move forward. And something that I always remind people is I don't care if you move forward a millimeter or a mile at a time. As long as you're moving forward, you will overcome whatever you're facing. And that's the thing. Resiliency and overcoming obstacles go hand in hand. You have to be resilient. When you're in entrepreneurship or just life in general, you have to show up with your armor on. You got to put your armor on because you're going to have arrows fired at you all the time whether it's from family or friends or coworkers or clients or trolls on social media, you're, you're, you're going to have arrows fired at you. So sometimes do those arrows penetrate your armor? Absolutely. And it may sting. It may hurt, but it's only temporary. You know, I remember I was watching this YouTube video of Steve Harvey and it came out about three years ago, and it's when Steve was still hosting Family Feud. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it was in between the commercial break, and he went on this like six minute rant about building your dreams. And he talked about, you know, one of his friends that he knew was going to be successful. And, you know, he started somewhere. And, and this friend of his that he was talking about started, you know, uh, in the summers. You know, in school, he would go and he would cut the lawns of people in the neighborhood to make extra money. 
And then it, it grew from there where he had a couple people that would work with him and he would get a portion of that money. And then before he knew it, he had a, a million dollar, you know, uh, lawn care business. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and Steve also said that, you know, sometimes you just have to take the leap of faith. He said, most of us are standing on the edge of that cliff with our parachute on our backs and gracefully stepping off that ledge. And we're going to pull that lever and that parachute is going to fly open. And, you know, we're going to pull the handles and have this nice, graceful, peaceful uh, traverse down to the ground. And he said, entrepreneurship's not like that. Yeah, I was going to say that is the hope, but for sure, it turns out to be something so different. <laughs> he said, there is no parachute in entrepreneurship. You have to jump off that cliff knowing that you're going to have some bumps. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to have some bruises. You're going to break some bones. You're going to get cut. You're going to get scraped. But he said at the end of that, he goes, the willingness that you are going to develop to overcome anything that you're faced will inevitably lead to, your, lead to your success. And I so resonated with that because I thought about all the things that I had to go through personally and professionally just in the last 23 years to my father's incarceration, to losing a home, to being married and divorced twice, to losing a business, to having to file for bankruptcy just four years ago, making millions, losing millions, making it back. You end up becoming a very special person through all of that. N not that I need to be a special person, but you develop qualities, you develop traits that you can then go and teach others because everyone thinks that they're alone. Everyone thinks they're the only ones that have ever filed for bankruptcy mm -hmm. or had two marriages that didn't work out or a business that failed. Everyone thinks they're so special that it's, they're the only person that it's ever happened to. Well, I'm here to tell you, I'm not trying to burst your bubble, but you're not that special. And neither am I. It was just a part of my story and my journey. But what I did realize, Bertine, is this. It was my duty and it was my job to share my story. It was my responsibility to show up every day. And we're in a very crazy time right now. I mean, this is a, it's a very chaotic time through, you know, obviously through, through this pandemic, through the obvious racial divide that this country has, but that still hasn't changed how I showed up. I still show up every single day, pouring empathy, sympathy, understanding, love, gratitude into my audience every single day, no matter what chaos is going on in the world, it's still not going to change how I show up because I'm needed. Just like so many people that are listening to this, they're needed too. You can't succumb to the outside situations. You still have to protect you. You still have to protect your family, but most importantly, you got to protect your heart. You got to get out of your head and you got into your heart because the way that I view anger and love, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Both can be spread like wildfire. Absolutely. So if you think about it, if there is too much hate being spread, guess what's going to spread? A bunch of hate. But in the face of adversity, if you say, you know what, there's an obvious problem here, but you know what, that's not going to stop me showing up and pouring love into everyone around me on social media. It catches on like wildfire as well. And it's those lessons that I learned growing up the way that I did and, and facing those things that I had to face and seeing it through it all to the end and, and continuing, it's allowed me to understand that, you know what? Yes, there's a, a global pandemic going on, but it also made me realize that I had my own personal pandemics that I was dealing with. You know, when I was signing those papers to file for bankruptcy, that was a personal pandemic. When I had signed the paperwork twice to, you know, for the divorce papers, the second one, you know, I actually had a son to worry about at that time too. Those were personal pandemics. You know, mm -hmm. cutting my father off from a year and a half of contact, that was a personal pandemic. My father going to prison, that was a personal pandemic. But there is a solution to every problem. There is an answer to every question. There is nothing that is not known. Now, again, with this global pandemic, we don't know what's going to come from this. 
you know, a good friend of mine, Christine Paracas, she's a leadership coach, and she came on my podcast a few weeks ago, and she said, you know, right now we're going through a Category 5 hurricane, a global Category 5 pandemic. Mm-hmm. And it's it's crazy. You know, there's there's roofs being torn off. There's businesses that are closing. People are losing everything. They're losing everything right now. And there's the eye of the storm is basically sitting over the world right now. And, and if you've ever looked up through the eye of a storm, if you've seen movies with tornadoes, you can clearly see the blue sky above. We, we can see the end is almost here. But what she went on to say is the scary part for a lot of people is this. We're going through this Category 5 pandemic, but we haven't gotten to the aftermath yet. And that was, it was such a powerful statement for me because think about it, you know, we're going through this pandemic right now. We don't know how much longer it's going to be. There could be a second wave, you know, due to all the peaceful protesting, all the people, no matter, I don't care how people could show up in hazmat suits. It's still not going to protect you. You know, there was a, there was large groups of people congregating all over this country. And, and again, that is everyone's God given right to, and I support how people wanted to handle this situation, but my whole point is, is that we don't know, we haven't gotten to that aspect of this pandemic to actually feel the aftermath. We don't know how long the aftermath is going to be. Once that hurricane is offshore and it is now out into the ocean, it's going to leave behind something. And what that something is, we don't know. But what I do know is whatever is left behind, there is going to be a solution for that problem. As long as we can congregate together and figure out how do we move forward from this? How do we come back stronger? Think about working out, Bertine. What do people do? I don't because I need to, but. (laughs) But the principle of working out is you go to a gym to break down the muscles, right? And then you eat healthy. And what do you do? You repair and rebuild them so they're stronger and better than before. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what's going to happen with this pandemic. We're, we're getting, it, it's breaking us down right now. It's breaking us down right now. But if we congregate and come together as one, we can build it back. This country, you know, this, this, society, this incredible society that we have, we can build it back stronger than ever so we can continue to progress. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, Trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. There are so many gems that you just dropped on our audience right now, really and truly. And I feel like I want to just break a few of those down because I I love what you said, first about the the hurricane and and us having the solution within, right? I think that a lot of times we do get caught up in our brain so much so that we miss the forest for the trees, right? And for me, and just what my belief is, is that this pandemic and this time that we're, honestly, this evolution that we're going through, as my friend Don Christian likes to say, it's an evolution that we're going through. And how we come out of it at the other end is totally within our power, right? So I feel like we can't, you know, we cannot control the pandemic per se, but we can control our reaction to it. We can control how we manage it within our personal power, you know, our personal capabilities. And then we can see our way to finding solutions to everything that honestly seems to be plaguing us right now. But a lot of it is of our own doing, I think, as well, right? Of social unrest, racial tension, a lack of communication. And I think people taking sides without actually listening. And so for me, part of the reason why 
Well, part of the way that I chose to deal with the pandemic was to delve further into my work and my podcast and, and you know, expand just my relationships and, and networking with people that, you know, before I might not have had the time to do. And it's ironic, but I'm busier now <laughs> than I've ever been. And I was busy to begin with, you know, which is true for you, which is true for so many other entrepreneurs, right? So now I'm just thinking to myself, okay, I've got to schedule this. I've got to do that. But it's with a happy heart that I'm busy in this way, right? So what you've said about showing up really, truly resonates with me because I had to make a decision. I believe in a SWOT analysis, a, a personal SWOT analysis, right? So your strengths, your weaknesses, your obstacles, and your threats. And so I do that for everything because I, and I do that internally with myself the most because I want to show up in the way that's going to best serve my audience, right? That's going to best serve me. That's going to preserve the person, not only that I've grown to become, but the person that I hope to continue to evolve to be. And so how am I going to do that and still remain authentic and still enjoy what I do? Right. And so this is this time has allowed me to peel back the layers, kind of expose myself to, you know, conversations I might not have been privy to before. And thus, you know, hopefully everybody else will walk away and say, oh, you know, I heard this. That made sense. I heard that. What about that? I didn't like that was said that that was said or, you know, why don't I like that? You know, so I think it's one thing for us to first be exposed to something. Right. Then decide whether we like it or not. And then explore why we do or don't. Right. Because what that's doing is peeling away more layers. So I've seen this pandemic as a personal pandemic on many levels um, as an entrepreneur, for sure, because that changed totally my business model. And I was starting to pivot prior to this to a more, a more so to the virtual world, but not to the extent that I've had to, right? So I was like, oh, great, now overdrive. Because again, the minute we were told it's quarantine time, everybody's staying in their homes, my mind went to my SWOT analysis. And I was like, all right, what are we going to do? And I realized that was not only my model for business on how I did things, but then it became my motto for life and how I navigated relationships and situations and things like that. So much so it was like riding a bike, right? Like you just, you crash a little bit in the beginning. I did a lot when I started to ride a bike. I wasn't athletically inclined. And then when I finally got the hang of it, like it was like I was born to do it, you know? And so this is what I'm starting to feel like now. So I love what you said about showing up because this is a time for growth, for evolution, for understanding. And this is a time where I think we have to, I'm a fan of Judge Judy ever since I can remember. <laughs> and so she's always said, you have to, you have two ears because you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. Right. And I always have that in the back of my mind. And I'm just like, okay, as someone who's a, a professional speaker, a podcast host, we both speak a lot for a living, but I think the, the beauty is us listening to other people, right? And then having that exchange of information, right? Because it allows us both to grow so much. And then I wanted to, something that you mentioned with regard to, again, how you're showing up and it being your duty and all of the trials and tribulations that you went to. I love your transparency because I think people think they are the only ones, right? People think they're the only ones to be divorced, the only ones to file bankruptcy. And here's the newsflash. So many entrepreneurs do, right? So many. I, I dare say our current president has filed for bankruptcy. So you can become president even if you file for bankruptcy. So there's nothing you can't do. And I think people tend to see that as something that would stop them dead in their tracks and destroy their dreams. But that's not the case, right? And again, it goes back to it being resilient. So I love that, you know, you're able to take that and turn it, take a negative and turn it in or something seemingly negative, right? And turn it into something that's overwhelmingly positive. But it brought to mind for me that iceberg, you know, that iceberg model about success. I feel like as entrepreneurs, we all need t-shirts with that iceberg and something to say, this is the real deal, the bottom part, right? Not the tip that they see. So I applaud you for sharing that with our listeners because People seem to think that success happens overnight. And you just like the other day, someone said to me, wow, you're doing so well. All of a sudden, you're just out there. All of a sudden, this has been a decade in the making, you know, and it took time and it took energy. And in the meantime, I got married. I had a child. We, we moved like, you know, life was evolving and growing. And 
I thought to myself, you know, I've written books throughout. So I'm just like, what? This took forever. And I'm just now starting, I think, to enjoy it, you know, but I think people are seeing that enjoyment as the success, right? As opposed to those building blocks that it took so long to make, because that's the success too. And then within that success, there's failure, right? And I think people are afraid to fail and to be an entrepreneur and to have that resiliency. Failure has to become your friend. Oh, I love that you said, well, first of all, people see the glory, but they don't know the story. Oh, so, wow. I'm going to borrow that. <laughs> so pe- people, people see that, you know, I'm a two-time best-selling author. They see that I'm doing these international keynotes. They see the large networks that I've built. They see the life that I'm, you have no clue, mm-hmm. no clue, number one, how difficult it's been to build all this because it it takes serious skill mm-hmm. to, to show up every single day, regardless of, of the internal or external environments that are out there, no matter what. And I, I can't tell you, Bertine, I've gotten so many messages through the years that people have thanked me for how I show up. You know, when everything was, when, when there was a lot of turmoil, obviously with the pandemic, when there was turmoil with our racial divide, when there was turmoil with uh, the first, you know, Trump's first election, when there was all this negativity out there, I still, I stayed in my lane and I focused on pouring love and understanding and empathy and sympathy. I've always been that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I had so many people thanking me for being that bright light because they were seeing their, because again, anger fuels anger. And I didn't want to add fuel to the fire. There's a saying that, that goes, live in the solution, not in the problem. Mm-hmm. So if, if we all decide to live in the problem, we're just going to add to it. But if we're solution oriented, we're going we're gonna to figure out how to solve for that problem. You know, whenever I do these online seminars and I do them through Zoom and I'm, I'm a very active trainer and speaker, so I have people use the chat box. And I always say that at a certain point, I said, I want you guys to affirm that fear is your friend. Wow. That's powerful. And so they, they all type in the chat box, fear is my friend, fear is my friend, because mm-hmm. they don't understand that, you know, fear is a choice. But what people need to understand, and I loved your bike analogy, because I actually use that. I always say that, you know, we don't learn how to ride a bike right away. We get, you know, we get our big wheel and then we get, you know, the bike with, with no pedals. And then we get, you know, a bike with uh, training wheels and then the training wheels come off and then mom and dad holds the back of the seat and they guide us around. Eventually they let go. It's just like walking. Absolutely. You know, what do, what do babies do? They push up, then they roll over, then mm-hmm. they crawl, then they, you know, guide, and then they start walking. It's not an overnight thing. And I always say, how many parents stop their kids from learning how to walk after falling so many times. Right. And the answer is not, you keep going. It's just like what Les Brown says, you may get knocked down, but if you can look up, you can get up. So that's how things are. So when I started learning all of this, you know, being solution oriented, understanding on the other side of fear is success, enlightenment, prosperity, peace. I seek fear, but I also seek failure. Because your failures teach you how to become successful. Every successful person out there has failed multiple times. So when you when 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 that when that clicks, right? When that mindset shift clicks, where you're like, oh my God, all I have to do is learn how to fail, and then I'm gonna learn how to succeed, you start seeking failure. But it that that failure ends up being a lesson. Right. You know, electricity was not created the first time. You know, the telephone was not created the first time. You know, we're always going through evolutionary things where, you know, there's prototypes and, you know, this didn't work and that we're going to do this. And we had to go back to the drawing board and do that all over again. Things happen all the time and they're not failures. Mm-hmm. They're lessons. But exactly. your, your failures always open the doors to your successes. Oh, I love that. What's that saying? Um, Nietzsche says you can't fly into flying, right? And so that's that same analogy of the baby learning to get up, learning to roll around, learning to walk, learning to run. And so I I always tell people there's a process. It just doesn't happen overnight. And I can't tell you, and I know this happens to you, that people see you speak, see you engage with an audience in a particular way. And they're like, I want to do what you do. And then when you tell them the commitment. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Right. All of a sudden. And I'm thinking to myself, well, then you don't want to do what I do. You want to do what you do, but you want to get the benefits of what you think I'm getting. 
right? And there's a responsibility, mm-hmm. you know, with, with, you know, the Spider-Man quote, with great power comes Don't great responsibility. It. I love that quote. I love that quote. There's another one that I, Arnold Schwarzenegger, actually, I heard, I heard one of his keynotes once and it was so, it was, this blew my mind. He goes, you can't climb the ladders of success with both hands in your pocket. Wow. That so is so I, on. I, it's so deep, but just think about it. Everyone is, wants to climb this ladder of success, mm-hmm. but their hands are in their pockets. So how, how are you going to climb each rung? You can't. Right. And you have to, so I use the example of Roger Bannister. So for those that don't know who Roger Bannister is, he was the mm-hmm. first person to ever run a sub four minute mile. And this oh. was done, I think, in the 1930s or 1940s. So in, in track and field, it was, it was impo- no one will ever be able to break the four minute mile marker. So, so this, that thought was now being ingrained in the DNA of every track and field athlete. So, you know, I'm going to run, but, you know, I'm never going to break four minutes. Wow. So, so Roger Bannister, made, he made that his, I am going to prove all of you wrong. So he broke that record. And, <laughs> it, and here's the crazy thing. In the two years, it, the, the two years that preceded him breaking that record, 13 other people did it. No way. Because think about it. When a concept is proven, when someone says, yes, you can go do this, what are people going to do? Well, he did it. Now I can do it too. Right. That's so just, fantastic. just think about it. Like the seeking to be a millionaire was like this big goal by, oh, that can't be achieved. And then someone became a millionaire. So other people learned how to do it. Billionaires. And it's, it's the same. All you have to do is see if someone has proved the concept, mm-hmm. which means you can do it too. But someone always has to go first. And if you're willing to go first, you're going to learn a lot of amazing things along the way. I love it. I love it. Well, now I can talk to you forever, Scott. I really can. So I'm going to invite you to come back to the show. Would love to. There's so much that I want our listeners to to just glean from you. And really, your story is so inspirational. So I want to ask you this. What are two things you'd like to impart upon them before I conclude? What two things do you want people to know? Number one, just realize that the thoughts, feelings, and opinions of others do not have to become who you are. So if you're not satisfied with the life that you're living, if you're not satisfied with the monetary income that you have, if you're not satisfied in the relationship that you have, you don't have to stay there. You're not a tree. Just move. So all you have to do is one thing, decide. Once you decide and commit to making a change, your life will change. The other thing is that what people need to understand, and this is the absolute honest to God truth, There are millions of ways of how to succeed, and there's only one way to fail, and that's to quit. So as long as you don't quit, as long as you don't give up, you will find a way of how to succeed. And that brings us right back to resilience. I love it. (laughs) I love it. So Scott, tell people where they can connect with you and find you on social media. Yeah, so I'm very omnipresent across all platforms. Uh, on LinkedIn and Facebook, you can just search Scott Aaron. That's two T's and two A's. On Instagram, my handle is at Scott Aaron LinkedIn, or you can always go right to my website, uh, which is www.scottaaron.net. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us, Scott, on this latest and honestly fascinating episode, if I do say so myself, (laughs) um, of the Global Fluency Podcast. So everybody, link up with Scott, follow him on his social media, and really think about this interview, take this conversation with you, and have it again with someone else at your virtual water cooler. Think about how you can become more resilient. And if you already consider yourself a resilient person, think about how you can inspire others to also be their best and become more resilient. So Scott, once again, on behalf of the entire gang at the Global Fluency Podcast, thank you so much for being a part of our show today. It was so great to have you and I'm looking forward to you coming back. Thank you, Bertine. Grateful for you and thank you again for the opportunity. So for everyone listening out there, remember, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. 
Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.